up and looked at me, and he actually said, Dad, Dad. <laughs> and, <gasps> what? Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Collider Mailbag. My name is Mark. Thank you guys for joining us on this lovely Sunday morning. Uh, <laughs> this is the show where we answer your emails. You guys can send them at any time. Collider Video at gmail.com. We're going to play through this intro, and I'm going to show everybody off at the panel. First up, we have Mark Riley. That was a beautiful <laughs> story. How you swaddled the cub yeah. Yeah. with your own shirt out in the cold, in the it, wilderness? It's too emotional to get into on camera, but that's why I told it You off, are a good yeah. man, Mark Ellis. I do what I can for nature. Uh, Sinead DeFries is also joining us here today. No, seriously, what? <laughs> I, you know, I, I live a... Uh, My favorite part of Mailbag now, this. Hey, I, I'm this. sure most people online don't agree with you right now. No. So let's get into the other thing we do here on Mailbag, which is answer your guys' question. Like I tried to say before, anytime you guys can email us, collidervideo at gmail.com. Sometimes we answer them on Movie Talk. Sometimes we'll do it on the weekends here at Mailbag. Sinead, what is up first? Andrew writes, hey, Collider crew, love all your guys' work. My question is about Hans Zimmer. I feel that he is on the list of the greatest composers of our decade, but he is never really talked about of the decade. I'm sorry. I hear the names of John Williams, Danny Elfman, and James Horner, but not Hans Zimmer. Some of his scores are mind-blowing and emotional at the same time. The one that really touches me would have to be the score from Inception, the last scene, the scene with the score that has me tearing up and makes me think if my life is a dream. But enough about me. I would like to know if you think that Hans Zimmer is underrated as one of the best composers out there today and some scores that you may like from him. Thank you and have a great day. Andrew, I will agree with you that if Hans Zimmer is not feeling the love from all the movie fans, we should be sending it his way because he's done some phenomenal work over the past two decades in particular. I actually really like the Batman v Superman score I thought it worked really well for that movie there were obviously some issues I had with the film but the score was not one of them I enjoyed how it accentuated the action happening on screen I think my favorite Hans Zimmer score is going to be an easy pick for me Riley it's going to be my boy Batman in Batman Begins and the Dark Knight it's just so good it feels like I'm back in that world in Gotham City and if you remember when Batman Begins came out it was, obviously Batman had a tall order to get the stink of Batman and Robin, yeah. but I also, I, I knew I was gonna miss that Danny Elfman theme from Batman 1989 and yeah. Batman Returns, but it really didn't make me miss that at all, and that's partially you know how good the movie was, but I think a lot of it is due to Hans Zimmer's score in that film. He is, I, it's so funny, because so many people say uh, Giacchino or G G G G I, kept, I kept hitting the hard, the hard C and everybody Giacchino, just I know. me. Giacchino. Giacchino. Uh, they've always said that he is the heir apparent of John Williams, okay? Mm -hmm. Which I get. But Hans Zimmer has been pitching almost a perfect game alongside John Williams for right. so many years. Um, favorite score is Inception. I love Inception. His music work on Inception is one of the best. Um, and Man of Steel. I love it. He had, I mean, talk about John Williams. He had a tall order. He has to then come up with a theme for Superman over John Williams' iconic score. And he did it. I'm sorry. You can, I can, I play his ideal of hope, the Man of Steel theme, Superman's theme, so much that it's now creeping up against the, the original Superman. So, yeah, it's funny. I do think he's a little bit underrated in, in as far as the discussion goes because we always talk John Williams, and then we talk about who's taking over for John Williams and Giacchino. So, they, you know, we're not mentioning Hans Zimmer. So, yeah, let's give him some props. So you did those uh, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Pirates Tyler of the mistaken. Caribbean. Those are pretty good scores. He's been around since the Lion King days. He did some musical he arrangement and work well. on yeah, Lion I mean, King. Everybody hears the Lion King, they think of Elton John, Can You Feel the Love Tonight, which is great, but yeah. it's like he really did a lot of nice work in that movie too. Yeah a lot of good work on on his side i mean you can put in most any of his scores and they're awesome gladiator is another one i just adore so uh yeah hats off to you mr zimmer han zimmer thanks for watching our show yeah he's next watching. question samuel writes hey glider crew big fan of the show my question is what time period do you think that dr strange will take place in the mcu timeline most of the films since phase one have taken place after the events of the previous movie and make some type of reference to that previous movie but strange was a name drop easter egg in winter soldier why would hydra target him in that film if he wasn't more than just a surgeon at that point and already the sorcerer supreme thanks yeah, that's a, it, you know, I thought about it. This question's great. I went back to thinking about that scene in, in Winter Soldier when they're targeting all the 
basically the supers, right? And Tony Stark was in there, obviously. I think Bruce Banner, I want to mm-hmm. say Bruce Banner was targeted as well. And so I was like, when it, okay, why would they target a surgeon? Because if we're just going off of the time frame, right, then he hasn't been the Sorcerer Supreme yet. He hasn't had his origin story yet. So it's a very good question. Were they just targeting him because he's so damn smart? Which makes sense. They needed a doctor, you know? They, yeah, I think I'm going with he's just somebody that is so damn brilliant in his job. Hydra's just trying to get rid of all the, the powerful brain peeps, you know, so that, you know, if they get rid of all the supers and then all of a sudden, you know, Dr. Stephen Strange is is – you know, thinking, using his mind, going, well, this is what we have to do. I don't know. I think it's a great question. I think it's actually how the Hydra meeting opened is, hey, we got to get rid of all the powerful brain peeps out there, yeah. starting with these medical professionals. I'm going to disagree with you, Riley. I think that he's already the Sorcerer Supreme. I think that's why that reference was built into the Winter Soldier. Now, look, you can tell this story a number of different ways because there's going to be flashbacks to what his life was like before his hands were rendered and usable and he couldn't be a surgeon anymore. So he had to go try to visit this this other you know worldly power and try to discover something like that led by the Ancient One. The good news in all of this is that we don't have to wait that long to find out exactly what timeline it's going to be on because the movie comes out early November. Yeah, so I like this. You think it's a prequel to like the origin story is happening as Winter Soldier perhaps going? So before the events of Ultron, before Civil War? I believe so. I like this. It, well, I like look, this. It, it would be harder to do if, the, if this movie took place in Nebraska. And it's like, well, wait, where is he? But he's going to be visiting other astral planes. There's, oh, there you go. Yeah, it's, there could be some time travel element. Or there could be some time skipping around in the storytelling. Sinead, when is this movie taking place? I also disagree with you, Riley. I think that Boom. we're going to go back a little bit. And I really Fine. like this question so much because I think it would be really cool and a good kind of like switch up in the timeline for us to get a movie that kind of gets our minds thinking about the past events especially since I really I really like miss the MCU as much as I love where it's going yeah. but kind of to see where this could fit in with things that have already happened is like exciting for fans you know I was thinking about this why do we even have Riley on the show it should just be the two of us you know <laughs> yeah. it'd be so much fun yeah I really I really like your story thinking but you're both so wrong <laughs> And I'm happy to leave. I don't need this, you know, whatever. Don't whatever make me. this is. I will send the wolf cubs on you, buddy. They listen to me. Yeah, when you said that, I got worried that I wouldn't hear any more wolf cub stories, and that's why oh, I'm don't staying. Worry. Not for coming. these not for these questions. It's the wolf cub. Keep tuning in the mailbag. In the meantime, what's our next question? Matthew writes, Dear Collider Crew, I've watched since the AMC days. My question is since Doctor Strange comes out in November, the movie is opening in Prime Academy Award time. Could this movie be the first comic movie? movie to have a Best Actor Academy Award. It certainly could, Matthew. There's a number of talented individuals in there that have been in award consideration in the past, headlined by Benedict Cumberpatch, but also Cumberpatch? <laughs> Cumberpatch? She would tell Edgy is also in this Tilda Swinton. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen is somebody who I think could really step up. Maybe he sneaks in as like, because sometimes they like to nominate bad guys in comic book movies or yeah. genre kind of films for a best supporting something, whether it's at the Oscars or Golden Globes. I... It's hard for me to say that it's going to happen, though. I think the smart money says no, but you never know. I just feel like this movie, and it's not a bad thing, it might have too much of a Marvel tone. And what I mean by that is that it's going to have jokes and there's going to be a light and fluffy pieces of this film. And that's not something that the Academy always enjoys when they're considering a performance. Unfairly so. But it's also the truth. How about you, Riley? Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, there's not going to be an Oscar nomination because of every point you brought up. But what if it's the, what if this is the one which is what this question is supposing so i like the idea of it if you think about the the source material it could lend itself to a really great performance um but yeah i think it's that marvel tone that the academy would kind of steer away from and i think if you look at the only other maybe character you can bring up is the joker and heath ledger's performance but that was such a reality based superhero movie that's the godfather of of superhero movies that performance alone is just so grounded in realism and Heath Ledger, God rest his soul, just killed it. So you can see why he actually won the Oscar and also was nominated. So I, I would love to see it. I really hope that they break past that ceiling and sooner or later we get uh, a superhero actor, the lead actor, whether it's a Superman, a Batman, a Captain America, who have you nominated that'd be fun well in the meantime they'll just have to be satisfied with their gobs of money that they're going to make this (laughs) holiday season Sinead what's our next query 
Daniel writes, hey folks, big fan here. I don't mind the Star Wars prequels. In fact, I was seven when The Phantom Menace came out and I loved it. But in the new Star Wars canon with everything new that's been coming out, movies, books, comics, etc., that era is largely ignored. I understand that Disney wants to stay away from the stink of the prequels and that's fine. But doesn't this negation of that time period diminish the importance of those events in the minds of the audience? Wouldn't it be better to tell new stories in that period which could redeem the prequels somehow instead of pretending they never happened how would you have handled it thanks and keep it up i love this question i actually totally agree with it and i think that disney has done a little bit of a disservice to the prequels to a ton of fans out there including me i have grown to love the prequels over time wasn't a big fan of them when they first came out but now i spoke with uh, about this with roca a lot when we were on our far far away podcast I think they should. I thought it would be great to tie the prequels in with Snoke being revealed to be Darth Plagueis. Now, I don't think that's happening, but we had a little bit of a mention of clones in Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. I want to say maybe there was a pod, uh, like a pod racer, like kind of thing on Jakku. Not sure, but I would love to see some references big references i'm talking something that actually goes that's from the prequels like midi chlorians i mean not midi chlorians slow your roll there ellis i'm not saying like all references I, and i'm not and i'm not i'm not hating on the idea of incorporating lore from the prequels into right. the new movies because it is part of canon there's a lot of greatness in there whatever you want to say about the movies there's some neat mythology that's going on mm -hmm. that i think added to the story that the classic trilogy showed us is, can you think of a specific example, though? Yeah, no, I think, um, so maybe so, like it would be great to see an old Naboo sh starship that's like kind of rusting on the side. That might be interesting. Revisiting Naboo would be interesting. I would love to see them go back to Naboo, especially because of the history there. It'd be interesting to see Kylo Ren there because his grandmother is there. That would be fascinating to see. One of my favorite fan artworks is Darth Vader in full Darth Vader garb in the tomb of Padme on Naboo and he's placing his hand Ooh. on the coffin in front of a, a glass mural. It's a great, great, great image. And so it would be interesting to see the iconic images of The Force Awakens that lend itself to the, the original trilogy showing up on some, just maybe Naboo, maybe have Darth Plagueis actually be something. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to do that, but it'd be interesting to see. And I think some mentions of it would be fine. Maybe Naboo or some of the other planets, Mustafar would be great. I, do, I mean, we don't have to go overboard. I do not want midichlorians. Absolutely not. I think you have to like, you know, pick and choose what you include, but I don't see why they couldn't do a prequel era spin-off movie and do it right. Can you employ the little lemmings that live inside our phone and have one of them send me that image that you're talking about? I mean, I, that sounds yeah, awesome. I will um, do my best. I, I, I think that I'm looking at this question less as, you know, a reference to planets, because it'd be nice to go back to Naboo or Coruscant, I think is also. Coruscant which I, would I think be great. It was, might even been, I, I can't remember if it's mentioned in the classic trilogy, but I, I thought it was a cool planet to see. And yeah. I like the way that that vision was realized, maybe more so than any of the other planets that we saw in the prequels. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking less like planetary settings or ships. And I'm thinking more actual mythology, which is why I brought up midi chlorians, which gotcha. I don't necessarily want to see them scientifically break down the force anymore. But something that we actually talked about on Jedi Council this week is whether they're ever going to investigate the Immaculate Conception. I think mm. it was actually a fan wrote in that question on Twitter and they hashtag Jedi Council, which is what you do. Do you think that we're gonna get any more in depth into Shmi and exactly what went down in the world that made that conception take place? Cause it'd be weird if they retconned it. I don't want that, I don't wanna see that happen where they're like, oh no, he actually, he actually did have a dad. She was just lying to Qui-Gon. I think Qui-Gon's too smart. Yeah, that. but do you think that they'll explore any of that myth any further? I, I think they will, and I think they have a great opportunity to do that with this new movie in Episode Eight. I think if Luke, as we know, is going off looking for Jedi temples and other remnants of the Jedi he's Order, he's been studying his little boobs I, off. I, you, you gotta, you gotta look into that, especially if he's having this midlife crisis, so to speak, mm -hmm. where he can't be a Jedi anymore and train anyone, might go back to his father, Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker. What does that mean? His mother. We could maybe look at Naboo as something he looks into, noodles around with. I would love to, like, does he go back to Coruscant um, to check out the, the Jedi Order or the Jedi Temple that might have fallen in the wars? We don't know. I would love to see that. And that is an expansion in the mythology that I think, especially with the prequels, would bring that into episode eight. I, I think it would be smart. There you go, Ellis. Oh, my there God. There you go. I found so it, everyone. Cool. I found it. Wow. It's very beautiful. Let me ask you a quick question. Yeah. And I just want a yes or no answer to both these. Okay. 
do we find out who Snoke is in episode eight, and do we find out who Ray's dad is? Yes on Ray's parents, no on Snoke. I think that's for the third movie. Next question. Sean writes, hey, Collider <laughs> Mystery Crew, what is your favorite scene of all time? Mine is the interrogation scene from The Dark Knight. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. That's one of them for sure is from Jaws is when Robert Shaw as Quint gives that incredible speech about his history with the USS Indianapolis and what happened between the sailors who went into the water and the sharks on that day. It is, it's one of the, it, it's highway robbery that he didn't get nominated for an Oscar for that movie or in fact win an Oscar. Uh, that's the one that sticks out in my head as my favorite scene. Obviously, because Riley and I are such Star Wars hawks, I'll give us one each from one of the Star Wars movies. Mine, as much as I love the Return of the Jedi scene, and it's something that people don't talk about much, which is fine, which is when Luke is being pushed out um, onto the skiff, onto the little board, and he just does the little oh, love thing that. with R2-D2, and R2-D2 shoots. They, it, it's such a great uh, display as to how their relationship uh, has been cemented, as yeah. they trust each other intrinsically, and just, it's an <laughs> awesome action scene. But in Star Wars, I will definitely go to the, the Binary suns, uh, binary Sunset one where just Luke looking out, thinking about what his future is going to be, wishing, wanting, hoping, and boy, is he in for more than he bargained for. That's my Star Wars one. Now I'll turn it over to you, Riley. Give me some of yours. Uh, I'll start with my Star Wars one, and it'll be Empire, and it'll be the start of Luke Skywalker meeting Darth Vader on Bespin. Um, when he comes up in, into the Carbonite Chamber, mm -hmm. the Pulse is with you, young Skywalker, but you're not a Jedi yet. Yep. What a line. Okay, then that whole duel intercut with the escape on Cloud City where they're trying to catch Han, but they can't get it. The Imperial's there. The music, the timing, the editing, the acting, the stunts, the effects work is all top notch. That's one of my favorite. It ends with him then finally jumping off mm -hmm. to wherever his doom, what Luke thinks, because he's not going to join Vader. I just think the stakes, it, it's just a beautiful scene. But I'm going to use another Spielberg movie, and that's Raiders of the Lost Ark. When Indy is drunk, in the bar after Marion dies, what he thinks, dies, oh. and Belloc shows up yeah, and, and, and uses the reference of the, the watch as if you bury this in 30,000 in 30, years, it becomes priceless. Right. That's why I want the Ark. This back and forth in India is just drunk off his gourd, and he's, he's you want to visit God? I'll send you to God. And he pulls up, and then the bar comes at him. What a great scene of mm -hmm. acting. Just such a wonderful scene to take place in the middle of an action movie. I am. Uh, I'm also going to throw the the good fellas. Uh, am I a clown? I, yeah. I, I think that's that's yeah. one of the all time great ones. <laughs> Now, now I'm really going to make people uh, realize that I'm not a credible source of this kind of stuff at all because it's it's just something that, that stands out in my head is from the 1994 or 5 classic Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> when the first you asked time me to leave me old bags? At Jeez. the beginning of the movie, when they get on the boat and they're about to go to Outworld and, and uh, they're just, they don't really know what's going on yet, there's just this scene and a door opens and it's Sub-Zero and Scorpion walking through it together, and it's just one of the coolest shots I've ever, I just love watching it. It just still makes the hair stand up my, it's, it's really? I, I love it. Really? Yeah. Hairs? Dude, okay. it's all, go watch it, go watch it, it's great. <laughs> I don't Shanae, want it. what are some movie scenes that uh, are, are your all-time favorites? Um, well, the first one that came to my head is the pub scene from Inglorious Bastards. Oh, yeah. yeah mm. I mean, we talked about that one before. That's that one is my fantastic. heart. My heart, the first time I watched that, my heart was like in my butt. I was yeah. so, I was on the edge of life. Excuse me. Wow. It's the Jesus. noise you get when yeah. it heart Ooh. goes into the butt. Yeah. Is aliens. Um, yeah. The airplane scene uh, from Bridesmaids. When they're oh, on the airplane. Yeah. Great. Oh, that's and, so funny. Um, funny. The big Lebowski. Oh, talk to me. When they're scattering the ashes. It's not many people's favorite scene of the movie. A lot of people talk about like uh, the Sinead, Jesus scene. That's mine. That no, is that's one mine. Of mine. Really? Yeah, the, keep when going. When it's and the I'll... dude and Walter and they're scattering Donnie's ashes over the cliff, I swear to you, like, <laughs> I must have, like, heaven opened up for me when I watched that scene. I was on cloud nine. I, I paused it. And I had I got on board with Big Lebowski for the first time. I watched it for the first time last year. Oh my God! So and yeah. And I paused it, and I was like, every everybody, everybody. I was like calling my mom, calling my dad, calling. My, I was like, everybody needs to watch this scene. It's so good. I have never laughed so hard in my life when he finally does scatter the ashes. They so blow back good. all on the dude, and he just his reaction. He's just a, and it just hits him, <laughs> and he pauses, and then he's like. You asshole, Walter! It's like, and he's like just flailing about. He's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, dude." And it's so, it's touching 
strangely touching, but it is, I'm sorry, I have, I paused it and rewound that particular moment mm -hmm. from the entire mm -hmm. scene over and over and yeah. over you again. You just wonder, what, when you see a scene like that, or you see a scene where somebody like gets water dumped on the head or whatever, like how many times did he have to shoot that scene? Did he get in the first take? Because it's a hard reset to do, but <laughs> that's a great, that's almost as good as the Mortal Kombat Scorpion <laughs> oh, Sub-Zero. Almost, almost. Almost as good. Yeah. All right, what's our next question? Tomlin writes, hey guys, greetings from Malaysia. My what's up? Quick question. What are your favorite movie cameos? I loved Hugh Jackman in X-Men First Class and Bill Murray in Zombieland. Thanks. Oh, I love that. I'm going to use another Bill Murray cameo, and that's in the dentist seat with Steve Martin and Little Shop of Horrors. Ooh, love that. Ooh. He steal, almost steals the movie. He is so damn funny. He is, he is addicted to pain, and, he, and he's coming in for this psychotic dentist who loves giving people pain and he's met his match. Mm -hmm. Bill Murray is is the match that that Steve Steve Martin's character is all he he couldn't break him. Everything he does and it is hilarious. I love that one. There and, and there's so many more. Uh, Ellis Get, give us one. Tomlin, it's a great question, and you cite two all-time classic examples. Uh, my, the one that always pops in my head first is Sam Kinison in Back to School. Oh, Sam Kinison, yeah. if you guys have never seen Sam Kinison or heard of him or seen him do stand-up, go on YouTube right now. Don't even watch the rest of the show. Just check out Sam Kinison. I, he is one of the great comic forces of all time, yep. and he's brilliantly used. Because he used to open for Rodney Dangerfield, and he was one of the young comics that Rodney Dangerfield, of the many that he really helped get a career going, yeah. Dangerfield used him in Back to School. It was perfect. The, hey, I'll, I'll, do you have some more? Because I'm going to close on one that nobody's ever going to think of. I, I, have, I have a couple more, but good answer. Thank you. I'm going to keep my eye on you. <laughs> That's his great. Um, I, I go back to Maverick, uh, the the uh, Mel Gibson oh, uh, yeah. movie with Jodie Foster. Mm -hmm. Great little Lethal Weapon cameo where there was like a, a moment, a, a scuffle. Right. And Danny Glover is one of the, the bandits and they have an exchange and he pulls down the mask and goes, I'm too old for this shit. And it's yeah. just a great little, you're like, yeah, all right. Uh, but one of my, uh, I'm trying to, oh God, it just went, oh yeah, John Hurt in Spaceballs. At the very end, the mm -hmm. alien pops mm -hmm. out, and it's actually John Hurt, mm -hmm. and he just looks at the camera and goes, oh God, not again. And it's just perfect, it's perfect. Should I get any uh, movie cameos you really like seeing somebody? Well, the first one that came to my head, if I'm being totally honest, is Austin Powers and Goldmember, with oh, yeah. like Tom Cruise, Gwyneth mm -hmm. Paltrow, oh, yeah, and Danny DeVito. Uh, Danny DeVito. That great. was the first one that I thought of. Yeah. The one that I absolutely love, and I'm glad I thought of it, because it was as she was reading the question, I was like, oh yeah, this one, is there's a movie starring Chris Elliott, called Cabin Boy. It's Chris Elliott and Andy Richter are in it, oh, and yeah. it's not a great movie, but it's got some funny parts. David Letterman. Oh, that's right. He makes a cameo in it that's at right. the beginning. Hey, you want to buy a monkey? It is, <laughs> it is so funny. It's, after you guys are done YouTubing Sam Kinison, check out David Letterman, Cabin Boy. It's just so funny because because Chris Elliott used to pop in to Letterman's show. Right. He was a writer on Letterman and he'd do some sketches and stuff. So Letterman did him a favor and popped into Cabin Boy and it is it's fall down funny. Yeah. All Very right. Good. What's the next question? Patrick writes, hey, guys, quick question for y'all. What's the what's the film that got you interested in the art of filmmaking? Not necessarily what is your favorite movie. Mine's Back to the Future. But the film that made you ask the question, how did they make that film? For me, it was The Social Network. Thanks, guys, and keep up the great work. Patrick Hogue, I enjoy your questions and your Facebook posts, sir, especially when they applaud me. Thank you, buddy. I'm going to say the movie that inspired me as far as filmmaking goes is Clerks. Mm, That's the one, one for me because it felt attainable. You know, you go to the movies, you see something huge. Like when I was a kid, you go see something like, uh, you know, in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, or you see The Rock, or you see Con Air, Independence Day. It's like, I don't, not only do I not think I could ever made something like that, I don't want to. It looks like so much work, but Clerks, it's one setting, it's done on the cheap, it's in black and white, and it's just funny, witty dialogue throughout. You get to know these characters through their conversations with each other. And I remember watching that being like, I could do something like that. I don't really want to, but I could do something like that. So that's the pick for me. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I always go to Jaws. Uh, as I got older, yep. um, Jaws became one of my favorite movies all time. It's, it's sitting at the number two spot all time. And that's mostly because of the film production and how I got involved in, I was like, how do they do it? Finally, it just occurred to me. I'm like, wait a minute. This like I read the Jaws log, which is a great account by the, the screenwriter of the movie, Carl Gottlieb, who just gave you all the adventures on set and how that, that shark didn't work. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a movie. So the, the Jaws is a perfect example of everybody on their A game. The, the, uh, the editor of Verna Fields, the uh, you know, cinematography, Spielberg, 
Brody, uh, Hooper, Quint, they would all eat dinner every night in Spielberg's home that he rented on the beach, and they would go over what they're going to shoot next. They would go over dailies. That was a truly collaborative process that Spielberg had to just think on his feet because this shark didn't work. So why did that? This shark doesn't stand up now, the mm -hmm. test of time. It looks fake, sure, but... It's no, a, I, think it's, it, I think it looks like a real shark. It, it's a total real shark. Who's seen more sharks but than the, me? You have yeah. seen so many sharks. Um, and wolf cubs. And wolf <laughs> cubs, for that matter. But yeah, it just the fact that they went through that, it was over budget, it was over days shot, it was, it was the biggest, it should have been the biggest mess of a movie, and instead it's one of the most iconic, one of the best movies, the first blockbuster of all time. So I, I loved it. Once I started to put pieces together of like, why is this movie so endearing? Why is it so, it endures the test of time? I started to study up on it, and that's when I realized, oh, I, I'm a film buff now, I love this, and then started to go into the classics, Godfather and, and Star Wars and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, another one that really just inspired me from a filmmaking perspective, the way the shot is set up, is the scene in Mortal Kombat when Sub-Zero and Scorpion come through I'm leaving. The door. It's really good. You all should check it out. You want me to leave? I'm leaving. All right, what's our last question of the day? Charleston writes, what's happening, Glider? I heard recently the Russos say they weren't ruling out the Defenders appearing in Infinity War, and I was thinking, story-wise, it wouldn't make sense. The reason I say this is because of the different tones of the Netflix Marvel series and the MCU, and the audience wouldn't understand why the Avengers would need to go find these street vigilantes, defenders, to help save the universe. What about you guys? How would Marvel? How would Marvel even write the defenders into Infinity War? Thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, I changed my thinking on this because there was a story a couple weeks ago on Movie Talk. Uh, John and I were, were going over show notes, and it was one of those things that Russo's did say. Oh yeah, we're not ruling anybody out, and everybody then went. The defenders are obviously mm -hmm. showing up, and this is a done deal. So. On Movie Talk, then John brought up a good point. He's like, absolutely not. Here's why, and you bring it up here, Charleston. It's the tone. The tone doesn't match. We're on a whole different, we're on the street le street level of heroes in Hell's Kitchen. So that's gritty, that's realistic. There's cursing, there's violence, there's all these things. So when you hold that up next to uh, Infinity War, the Marvel Universe, it doesn't match. So I think there can be passing mentions. I think there might be a mention. Maybe a cameo, but yeah, I don't know how you see it, but Alice? There is some mysticism that they're involving sure. in there, and so that could play a larger factor if you had to have them in Infinity War. I, I don't know that you need them, first of all. Yeah. I don't know that it's necessary. I don't know that anybody's going to go see the Infinity War films and walk out being like, well, wh we didn't get Daredevil. What the hell? Having said that, I don't. I wouldn't put it past them to put in some sort of either, like Riley said, a passing mention or a cameo, or maybe even a scene that has them in there. What stops me from thinking that's going to happen is just the way that Marvel has set their infrastructure up to have less interaction between what's going on with Netflix and what's going on with the movies, because the way that the executive shakeups have happened recently, it's like you focus on your division and you focus on your division, so there's less chance for crossover. Not saying it's not going to happen, and I would appreciate it, but I think what they would rather do with Infinity War, to be honest with you is set up like, like put in Spider-Man and what I mean by that is the way that Spider-Man was introduced to us first in Civil War in a smaller role and now we are clamoring for him and his own standalone franchise pepper in some seeds like that of yeah. potential new characters that we'd want to see not in a Netflix series but in another big budget Marvel movie going forward because we don't know who's making out of Infinity War alive, who's going to continue on with their current characters, so they would always want a chance to showcase and give a soft landing to a new character that we haven't met on the big screen yet. I don't think they would spend that on Defenders, which already has a nice thing going on Netflix. I think they'd spend it on somebody else that we haven't met as much yet. Here's a question for you because there is a report out there that the Punisher might cross over with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yes. If that happens... Do you think that's the the big a big sign that it could happen for Defenders and Infinity War? I'm, I mean, it, they've been pushing in humans really hard on Agents of Shield, and I know that they Marvel wanted to do an Inhumans film that was going to be after Infinity War, but I think they they, they put that they yeah. took that off the table. They for took right it off the now. table. Yeah, the Punisher is such a crossover success where people want to see the Punisher. I don't know what he would do in Infinity War. I don't really know what Daredevil would be able to do in Infinity War. They're not bad boots on the ground to have. If you no. have like an, an invasion or something, you got to defend the streets. They're the guys to go to. I just don't see it happening in yeah. Infinity War. I think there's already so many characters and such a rich story to tell. I think we're good with what we have right now. Yeah. All right, well, that is going to do it for us here on Collider Mailbag. I want to thank the entire panel, but everybody behind the scenes here helping us out. That's Adam over there. That's Cody. That's Wendy. Hi, Wendy. 
And now we have our panel up here. Uh, Riley, where can everybody find you online, sir? You can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. I will be on the Schmoes No Main show this coming Thursday. Whee. And don't forget Collider Nightmares on Tuesday. I'm there as well. Miss Sinead DeFreeze, where can the kids check you out? I'm online at Sinead DeFreeze and at that's Sinead.com here on Mondays hosting TV Talk and Fridays hosting Movie Talk and hanging out with these guys on the weekends on Mailbag. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to Mailbag. It really is fun rolling out of bed on the weekends and coming here, chatting with both you guys and everybody out there. Comment right now. Let us know what did you think of our takes to your questions and keep firing in those questions. Make them as original as possible. We're always happy to answer anything and everything y'all send in. Collider video at gmail.com is the place to mail your query. As for me, you guys can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. Hopefully, Riley actually texted me that picture of Darth Vader that we were talking about, and I can post it there. And you guys can find me at New York Comic Con. In a couple weeks, I'll be doing the New York Comedy Club Thursday night only. I'm running my brand new hour, 8.30 and 10.30 shows. Get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you tomorrow on Movie Talk. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.